So, Laura, it's uh, an honor to have you here. I really appreciate it. I'm very pleased to be here, too. It's an honor for, the honor is for me. Well, we're in New York City, which is uh, not where either of us are uh, from, to hear, here to talk about Borgogna wines. You are one of the few people that I've actually met that grew up in Borgogna proper, in a really, you really grew up there. And everyone who visits, you know, some people that are listening to this right now dream of visiting that region, but many have. And when you go there, I think the first thought people have is what would it be like to live here? It's so incredible, all these small, beautiful little villages. So I want to start with you and your family and where you're from. We are from Bourgogne, uh, as you said, uh, specifically from Nuit Saint-Georges. Uh, I live and my grandparents uh, and my parents uh, used to live just outside of Nuit Saint-Georges in the small hills, uh, which are called the Haute-Côte. Uh, so the small hills which are dominating the Côte de Nuit and the Côte de Bonne in a place which is absolutely beautiful, very small village. Stunning. Uh, less than 200 inhabitants in the middle of the country. When did you first taste wine? When was the first time you remember? I remember when I was seven, eight years old, uh, still my father, my grandfather, my uncle tasting wines. And often, my, especially my grandfather, was showing me the glass and uh, just smelling. And he was asking me, try to describe what you smell, what you feel, uh, what are the perfumes and so on. So that was really the beginning of my wine education. It's incredible. So 200 people in this village. Mm. So obviously you must, I mean, literally know everybody. I mean, it's, Absolutely. In a situation like that, how does it stay? I mean, the wines there are very valuable and the place has a tremendous amount of respect. How does it stay as humble as it is? It's, you know, in Bourgogne, uh, our background is very uh, agricultural. So there are people from, from the land, from the soil, from the terroir, uh, and that's really what our culture is. Uh, Bourgogne, contrary to some other region, so far it was really local families with very small estates, very small uh, vineyards. That's really the characteristic, uh, the main characteristic of Bourgogne. And it's really people from the land, very simple people uh, with a direct relationship with the terroir, with nature, and so on. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, look, I've spent a lot of time filming in these places and meeting people. I find, I find the people, especially in Bourgogne, to be some of the kindest people that I have worked with in France. I mean, uh, how, what is the culture like compared to somewhere like the south of France or Paris or Normandy? I mean, what, what makes Bourgogne special from a standpoint of living there? I'm asking you as a, as a, a resident who grew up there. It's a place where uh, time passing is very important. We all know, especially in viticulture, that uh, everything takes time. And it's a kind of philosophy, if you see what I mean. We've been producing wines in Bourgogne for 2,000 years. Uh, it's really at the beginning of the Middle Ages, by the 11th century, that we started to realize uh, that we had incredible terroirs. We started really to vinify the wines separately uh, and to promote the, the name of the local place and so on. And when you plant some vineyards, it's for at least eight years. So it's not for you, it's for your children or grand, grand or, or grandchildren. Uh, when you are a winemaker, as I have, as I am, you make wine only once a year. Of an old wine grower, uh, maximum, has made 50 different vintages. Uh, so, uh, and we hedge the wines a long time before we bottle them. And you can also keep our wines for a very long time when you have the uh, opportunity to test old vintages from great vintages and great growers who have been kept uh, in good conditions. Uh, it's a little like traveling in time. And uh, we are very aware that we inherited from uh, our ancestors uh, that they uh, shaped and they, they, they built uh, our vineyards, the terroirs, and so on. Uh, when you are working, your generation is in charge of uh, managing them as well as you can, but in order to pass them on to the next generation. So this uh, philosophy of long time is very important. Does it, it's it, very well put, but does it make it hard to change anything? I mean, you know, we're going to get to the conversation about the change that's happening mm -hmm. climatic, climatically and other things, but, but what if somebody wants to make a change? How long? Is it generations huh. to make a simple change? Or No, I think there are a lot of, uh, of changes every day. I mean, we are uh, also uh, 
very modern. We, we, we work with a new technology. We, uh, we try to improve uh, every, every day and to do some experiments and so on. But there are some rules that uh, are important for us. They are really the rules which uh, built uh, Bourgogne and uh, the, the quality and our reputation and so on. So we try to be very conscious. And so as far as I'm concerned, every time there is an important decision to be made, I try to think what would have my father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather done in similar conditions. And uh, is the decision I'm going to take uh, in line with uh, what uh, is our philosophy and what makes Bourgogne so special? Let's talk about what, what is going on right now. I want to talk just briefly about climate change and mm -hmm. the thing, um, the perspective of Bourgogne, because, I mean, it's so specific. The grapes that you guys work with you know, primarily Pinot and Chard are so specifically, I, I don't want to say difficult, but they, they need a certain parameter. So talk to me about climate change and, and when it started to become something where you're like, this is real, it's happening. It's, yes, absolutely. I think the wine growers are probably even on the, on the edge to see and to understand uh, the climate change and the effects of the climate change. Uh, especially my generation, so many things have changed in the last 35 years. Starting with the date of harvest, with the long history that we have in Bourgogne, uh, we have a lot of records. And so uh, there was a, a team of historians who studied the date of harvest over the last more than 600 years. And uh, very interesting to see that between the 14th century and exactly 1988, uh, the, average, the average date of uh, the harvest, the day when uh, we were starting the harvest uh, in Beaune, uh, was the 24th of September. And since 1988, so until now, so in the last 40 years, uh, it, it is now the 12th of September, so it's almost two weeks earlier. Uh, and we see that it's more a kind of climate disturbance or climate mm. disruption than really warming. That might because, be a better way to put it, yeah. yeah. Because actually we see more and more extreme conditions actually. So it's a succession of extremely warm and dry uh, years, then extremely uh, wet and humid this year. Uh, 2024, we had 40% more rain than we have normally. 40% uh, yeah. more rain. That is a so. This is and hail too. I know that the hail is a scary moment for you guys. We had some hail, hail storms, especially in Chablis uh, in May. But actually, we've always had some hail. Bourgogne is a large region. It's uh, about 150 miles uh, from the north to the south. Uh, so a lot of different conditions, a uh, lot of different subregions, and hail. Storms have always happened, and but the eight storms are always very local. So it's a uh, one village or two villages or something like that, but it never damages uh, the whole the region. Whole region. Yeah. You've been a winemaker essentially your whole life, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I know that you've traveled around the world and learned and um, worked in the south of France and also America, is that right? Yeah, I started my career just after my university studies. Uh, late 80s uh, in California. Uh -huh. I worked in uh, the Napa Valley for one year. Where did you work? Uh, Do you remember I worked in a, in a small uh, winery called Villa Mont Eden, which used to be family owned, belonging to a, a San Francisco family. And I know that they sold later. I think it disappeared now. Uh, but it was a fantastic experience. Uh, I was 21. I had uh, one, of the, one of, of the best years of my life. I also uh, studied a little, took some lessons at Davis University. Oh, Davis. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, you would have been at that. I mean, there's some very important people that would have been at Davis at that same time mm. uh, that are now very, very important people. Um, yes, yes, yes. I mean, geez, Kathy and, Corson uh, could have been there. I mean, you could, it could I have don't, been. I don't know if we have time to, uh, if I have time to tell you all these stories, but I used to have a mentor uh, when I worked in, uh, in in the Napa Valley, and this mentor was Andrei Chelichev. <laughs> you, you, so, you used to have a mentor who was one of the most important yeah, people absolutely. in American wine history. Because he used to be a friend of my grandfather mm -hmm. when he uh, came from Russia in the 30s. Uh, right. He arrived in Dijon in Bourgogne and he studied enology in Dijon. And uh, my grandfather used to live in Dijon. They became wow. friends. So when I went to California, uh, I was uh, sent to Andrei Chelichev. And uh, it's a fantastic memory. Uh, it was a fantastic introduction. I've heard some very funny stories about him from people who have 
studied under him and were, mm. and he just had a, he had a knack of thinking mm. about things. Mm. And I heard this one story of one time, they were having a lot of trouble blending. This was with uh, Robert Mondavi and others. And Chalachev said, I can't properly do the blend unless I have a cigarette. <laughs> it, was, it was absolutely him. And you know uh, what was very funny? Uh, yes, he was uh, heavily smoking. And, uh, but uh, when I was coming, and I was 21, he was right. 90. Sure. So uh, he was hiding his cigarette be behind his, his, uh, his back, a little like a child. Uh, oh, to not I've done be a, caught a by wrong you? thing. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Like you can't like see it and smell it and know it's right there. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Uh, so when you became president of this organization, I mean, talk to me about, I mean, you must know everybody. So how hard is it to run when, you know, I mean, you're talking to all of your cohorts and you also make wine. How do you, how do, you do this? Is it very political? Is it? Uh, it's, a, it's a little political to some extent, but actually, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I have, uh, our history is very special because uh, we moved with my wife to the south of France, to the Languedoc, because our family winery was uh, eventually was sold. Uh, it left, uh, we lost it actually. So that's what uh, led my wife and myself, uh, we are both winemakers, to uh, go to the south of France, the Languedoc, and start making new wines in the Languedoc. And it was a fantastic also uh, period of our life. And we came back a little later, much later, and uh, 25 years after the winery was sold, I had the opportunity to buy it back. That was, it's pretty recent. That was only in 2017. So it's uh, seven years ago, eight years ago now. And uh, of course, I always kept all my relationships with uh, everybody in Bourgogne. And uh, I think it's probably due to the fact that I had some experience uh, outside of Bourgogne, California, south of France, Languedoc, that eventually some of of my uh, friends, uh, f producers, uh, came to me and said, we think uh, you should submit your candidature uh, to become the president. You we think you should, do, uh, you should be a good president. Uh, and I did that only because uh, I was having some friends who asked me and told me that they believed uh, it was my turn to take this responsibility. It's, uh, for me, that's not something I would have done by myself. It's something, um, it's important to be asked and it's, it's, it's a responsibility above all. It's not something you do, it's not an achievement, it's you take a responsibility and you know that you are going to work to help your uh, fellow uh, producers. Uh, it's just for a limited period of time. Uh, four years, is that right? It's for it's four years. You can, it's exactly like the, Being the, the president American, of the United States, yes. Exactly, you can do it twice. Uh, but maximum uh, two. Uh, but unlike the president of the United States, it sounds like you can actually get some things done. Um, we, we I, our president doesn't do anything. <laughs> I don't want to argue. <laughs> I have no idea about the, the American uh, politics. But we, yes, it's important to try as much as you can. And to be honest, uh, when you are uh, a producer, when you are a negotiant, when you work in Bourgogne, you are uh, what is done collectively through the Bourgogne Wine Board, the BIVB, uh, by people who are volunteers tears to do it because we do it uh, in addition to our normal job uh, at our wineries so it's a it's it's very time consuming but uh, you benefit on, of it when no, you are a producer what we do with the Bourgogne wine board the BIVB is all what cannot be done at uh, the individual level of a small estate or of, or of a small uh, negotiation house so it's mostly uh, promoting and developing the image of the region, helping the producers to promote their wines. It's also, and this is probably the most important part, it's also uh, research and development, bringing to the producers new techniques in terms of viticulture, in terms of winemaking, in terms of uh, uh, wine aging and so on, to improve the quality and to answer to some concerns uh, that the producers may have. Like, uh, like what? What would be? You know, I take an example. Uh, the BIVB, the technical uh, department of the BIVB, handles now about 70 projects of research and development. Two thirds of them are linked to the, the climate change and to the consequences of the climate change. How do we and how are we going to continue to adapt uh, the way we are working to the climate change in order to, uh, to keep the quality of our wines, to adapt to the situation? Uh, that's very important to say that we work about the consequences because there are not a lot of things we can do to work on the cause. Uh, 
Right. Uh, <laughs> so that's unfortunate. But it's important to do it anyway. So we have to take our part. Uh, and it's also a big decision that we took about two years ago at the BIVB for the whole region is to uh, try to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 60% uh, by 2035. That's the only way we have to try to be part in trying to solve the problem. And the last, the last uh, thing that the BIVB is doing is also uh, what I would call uh, economic intelligence, uh, bringing the, Bur the Bourgogne producers uh, all the information they may need about uh, the market, uh, the consumers' uh, behavior, and so on, for them to give them the, the, the possibility and the, uh, the information to adapt to the, to the situation and uh, yeah. promote their wines. I think it, it's, it's a stunning thing when you get into wine And I mean, I'm not, look, I've worked in, in wine making films and all of this stuff for now, and mm -hmm. geez, 14 years or so, but I can't touch the, the practical knowledge you have with the dirt. Mm -hmm. But it is an incredible thing to see the diversity of wine and just, just the different styles of the way things are made in Bourgogne. Mm -hmm. It is an incredible breadth of difference. Um, is, it, is it hard to make people realize How, uh, it's, um, <laughs> how wide a range? And I know that it's primarily, it's, what, three grapes? I mean, if you're going to count Eligo Day, it's, but... It's even mostly two. Yeah, uh, right. I mean, so actually, it's... Uh, 94% uh, is made with Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. And uh, the diversity uh, comes uh, only from the terroirs and from the, 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 the different terroirs that we have. And uh, we have a kind of unique mosaic of terroirs in Bourgogne. And uh, that's really what makes Bourgogne speci so special. And as it took a long time and it's been done over a long time, that's the reason why we have that many appellations. Uh, in Bourgogne, we have 84 different appellations. It's simply the world record. It's, uh, it is something that I, I I'm always curious if, because it, it's not like people do not know of the region. I would say if, if it's not the most respected region in the world, it's. You know, It's right one of them. there. Mm. I don't want to get into an argument, but I would say it is. Um, but I think that just making people understand that it's not just one thing. It's mm. not just, you know, um, I, I hate to say it. I mean, some of these wines can be very, they can, they can cost a lot. They're very high quality, but there's also, I don't know of many regions where you can get more approachable, incredible wines for the price than Borgonia. It's such an amazing, to, to have that in the same region is really wild. I mean, that's... We that's, are very lucky and very fortunate. Uh, we know that. Uh, it's what also fascinates uh, people about Borgogne. It's the fact that uh, one life is not enough. When I started in the early 90s, a lot of uh, Borgogne producers were absolutely convinced that they were making the best wines in the world, but they were not able to tell why. Uh, it was simply like that, because it was Bourgogne and our wines were very much uh, sought after. But uh, actually, they, in fact, they were making wines exactly the same way as their parents, grandparents, and so on. And a little uh, later, in the mid-90s uh, and the following years, uh, with the new generation starting to travel, uh, everybody started to, un to understand that quality is not something which is Uh, stable. That's something that you have to uh, keep to increase uh, year after year. And it's the addition of hundreds of very small details. And actually, this philosophy of making very small uh, minimalist experiments, experimenting new techniques, but sometimes f small, small details, it really came from traveling all over the world, seeing what was happening, understanding that uh, there were some other regions in the world where quality was improving dramatically. And uh, you, you have to pay attention not to be just seated on your chair waiting. Uh, and you know, my daughter, I have a daughter who is 26, who uh, studied uh, business and winemaking and viticulture. Uh, she was very lucky because she had the opportunity to work for one vintage at DRC, the Man de la Romane Conti. And uh, it, was, it was very impressive for her to work with the winemaker and to see him uh, being so uh, precise, so anxious, and just trying to improve Mini, minimalist details every year because even when you are DRC, you can and you have to try to improve and do better year after year. 
Yeah, I think especially mm. when you're DRC, you have exactly. to do that. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, it's an amazing thing that I, I we had the opportunity to film there uh, for the second Psalm film, and Alberto Valen said, "What bottle would you like me to open on camera?" He and he he pointed to he had several very good vintages. I mean, a very I mean stuff that like once in a lifetime for some people. And I said, I don't want you to open any of those. I want you to open up what you think was a very challenging vintage that you're proud of. Very because, interesting. And he said, I mean, I thought he was going to cry. He was like, this, he goes, that makes me very happy because there are, anyone can make a good vintage in mm. a good year and they can sell for great money, mm. but to make a great vintage in a tough year, and that's the vintage we opened. Mm. It, was, it was an incredible thing. And that's, that goes to show... The, uh, the sign, and I don't think it's just for DRC, it goes to show the sign of the whole region of what you're saying. It's, I, I don't, there's never, you don't ever give up. You're always trying to figure out how do we do this the yes, best. Yes, it's a, it's a very important philosophy and I appreciate very much what you said about uh, tougher years and so on, because you're right, that's, that's these vintages which uh, remind in, a, in, in the winemaker's memories. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really where you show the difference. For sure, for sure. Well, so you, you spoke a little bit about the next generation. Mm. I honestly am very, the ones I've talked to, I think are very proud of them. I think it's like the continuation of what you said when you started this, of your grandfathers, your great-grandfathers, grandmothers, everyone who built this place. How do you feel about the next generation? Um, you're not that You're not that old. You've got a lot more winemaking to do, but... Oh, I'm but, older uh, than, uh, no, than, but, than you may think. But no, that's... Uh, I, I have, um, it's very important for me, and especially uh, when I think about my daughter, uh, who, uh, who joined us and uh, start, is starting to work with us. So for me, it's very important to, in the next 10 years, my task is going to prepare uh, everything to pass, uh, to pass on to her. Uh, I think with the new generation traveling, seeing other, ex having other experiences, seeing uh, other situations and so on, I think they are going to be uh, even more arm to save the future. I see the way my daughter uh, and her friends are together, how they behave. They are, they are wine lovers. They are really wine lovers. That's really what uh, brought my daughter to this uh, industry. Uh, that's the love for wine and all the, the, the lifestyle uh, which goes with it. Uh, and the, the history way we, and everything. The history, right? the, that all the culture and so on. And uh, it's very interesting to see them when they, uh, they go out uh, in Beaune or in Dijon, uh, they go to wine bars uh, and they, they, they love tasting wines, they love uh, going to make wine tastings in uh, other wineries and so on. So, uh, no, no, I'm very confident. That's great. It's, it's an honor to talk to you. I mean, I could do this all day long, but I know you have uh, quite, a, quite a bit to go to and probably some wine to go drink. So I, wanted, I want to say thank you and uh, I am I'm definitely drinking some more Gondi wine today now that I've had this conversation. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Jason. It was really a pleasure to, to meet and to talk with you. It's an honor. Thank you.